This program is brought to you by Emory University. So, um, everybody hear me? Yes. In the back, can you hear me? Okay. I taught introductory psychology in this classroom for 15 years and didn't use a microphone, but I haven't taught it in about five years, so I'm not sure if I still have the voice, but I hope I do. If I, if I don't, just raise your hand, okay? <clears throat> My name is Marshall Duke. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychology uh, here at Emory. I want to welcome you. As you've been welcomed by everybody else, I, I want to add to that. Uh, but... Um, I'm here to talk to you today about what to expect being the parent of a college student. And uh, I've been giving a talk uh, to parents on this orientation day now for mm, about 25 years, which is a long time. I've been practicing it, um, so trying to get it right. Um, but the, the, the credentials I have for, for telling you about this are, are, are perhaps least the fact that I've been here at Emory since 1970. I've been, I've been teaching at Emory for almost 40 years now and have seen a bunch of students come and a bunch of students go, three of whom were my own children. And so this is the credential that I place before you is that three times I've done what you did today and that is come here in the morning with a car packed with boxes and picked up the boxes and carry them up to the, always the top floor of the dormitory no matter where my children were housed, we had to go to the top floor, and then we would maybe bring it down. But otherwise, we always sweated and complained and carried boxes, and my wife would make the bed for the last time. Not her last time, but the last time the bed would ever be made. <laughs> so, so, which is, I'm sure all of you have done that, and all the color coordination, things like that. They'll be gone tonight, you know. <clears throat> But it's a, it's a very, very wonderful and, and, and sobering experience, and I, I, I want to talk with you uh, about that. The, the dormitories uh, are different now than they were in past years, um, in large measure because they're air-conditioned. Uh, some of you, how many of you in, in like Dobbs or Alabama, places like that, these old dorms were not air-conditioned, and it was the tradition at Emory that, that freshmen would live in air-conditioned dorms here in the heart of the South for the month of August and September until it got cool here. And that was sort of a rite of passage. That was until 1996 when the Summer Olympics were held in Atlanta. And Emory was the location for the uh, judges and the referees and all the officials for the games. And Emory gladly agreed to air-condition the dorms <laughs> for the Summer Olympics. So all of you and your children are benefiting from the Summer Olympics which reminds me of something that I have to tell you about. I have here, at great risk, our cameraman, George, suggested this was great risk in doing what I'm doing here. And that is, I brought this onto the campus. But I brought it for a purpose. And that is to tell you to get it out of your houses. If, if, if you drink this, our tuition will go up. This is Pepsi. There is no Pepsi. Like, there's no crying in baseball. There's no Pepsi at Emory. <laughs> we just don't have Pepsi at Emory. And, and you saw you got all kinds of free Coke products today. But there are no Coke products here. There are no um, food service uh, locations in any of the, the uh, student centers that have uh, Pepsi, Coke. The reason for that is that this university is heavily endowed by Coca-Cola and has had a long-standing relationship with Coca-Cola. <clears throat> Going back to uh, the land for the uh, campus here, having been sold to Emory by Asa Griggs Candler, who was the founder of the Coca-Cola company, but his name you see in a couple of places on this campus. You see the Candler Library and things like that, but you see the name Woodruff everywhere, don't you? The Woodruff Library, the Woodruff Pub, uh, Physical Education Center, the Woodruff Nursing School, the Woodruff School of, of the, the Research Center, all Woodruff. The reason is the man outside the library standing with a cigar, the statue that you saw, 
Robert Woodruff came to Emory in 1917 or so and registered here as a freshman. And he stayed for one semester, <laughs> at which time he said, I've learned enough. I'm leaving to make my fortune. Well, it turns out that he did. <laughs> and then when he had made his fortune, he began looking to Emory as his alma mater. And Emory decided not to quibble about seven semesters. <laughs> Why quibble? Seven semesters, sure. So he is our most wonderful alum, or was. <clears throat> Things named after him, and yes, indeed. He received multiple honorary degrees from this place, and uh, clearly the, the gifts that Emory has received that have, that have helped to, to move it from the university I came to in 1970, which was a wonderful small regional college in the South, which trained the professionals, uh, the, the, the lawyers and the doctors and the ministers and the dentists for the Southeast. Uh, the Woodruff Foundation has brought us to being an international university, which is a Division I or Level I research university, uh, ranked in the top 20 in US news for almost 20 years. A great buy, according to Kiplinger, all these things that you're, you're looking at now that, that say, yeah, you've made a good decision in bringing your child to Emory. And I think that you have. And I know that from the other side of it, having three children who've graduated from here, I know that you've made a good decision. But you're concerned probably also that whether or not we've made a good decision. 16,000 students applied to Emory this year. 16,000. There are 1,312 new freshmen arriving here on campus today. 1,012 out of the some 4 million freshmen that are starting college across the United States this week or last week, next week. So we have a very special 1,312. And we know that. And one of the most exciting things for me, as well as for, for most of the other people here at Emory, is that we have the infusion onto this campus on this special one day of 1,312 new students, but also 1,312 new families. And what I want to talk about with you today is some of the things that you would expect to be happening or know about what's going to happen, uh, be happening to your students, but also about what I think you need to know about what's going to be happening to you as families, as, as parents. So the first thing I want to say is that the admissions office doesn't make mistakes. In other words, you haven't tricked us. <laughs> Even though some of you, having looked at your students' applications and essays, saying, you know, oh, God, <laughs> or sneaking in at night and changing them, you know, you haven't, you haven't fooled the admissions office. Our admissions office is really good, and we take students at Emory that are going to make it through Emory. We have 1,312 starting today. It will be our greatest hope and dream and, 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 and degree of satisfaction if at four years from now we have 1,312 degrees to give out to them. And we do. If all of them go through and finish in four years, there are 1,312 degrees. So it's not that a certain number are going to make it and a certain number aren't. Everybody can make it. And we, we're committed to that. We don't want any of them to leave, to leave here or to not have a good educational experience here. <clears throat> we accepted them because of that, because we know that they're the kind of students who will fit with Emory. And Emory will benefit from their being here. Now, I know that from my discussion with the admissions office folks, that the grade point averages of many of your students are astronomical. 11, 14, what, you know. 6.9, you know, and the best I know is 4.0, but they have all these APs, and so the GPAs, the grade points are very high. Every year at graduation, we have an honors ceremony, the day before graduation, in which we recognize the Phi Beta Kappas and the people who've won uh, Truman Fellowships and Fulbrights and all the honors, summa cum laude, magna cum laude, and all the students who've graduated with special honors. And among that group, we have a group called the Honor Graduates. And the Honor Graduates are people who have completed Emory four years with a 4.0 GPA. Last year, there, I think, was one. The year before, there were two. Year before, zero. What am I saying? 
1,312 students are starting today. 1,310 are likely to not have 4.0s. <laughs> so let's just put it aside. It's not a, a reasonable expectation. It's not a reasonable expectation. It's not a reasonable pressure to put on you or on them. It's not going to happen. They will have good, wonderful GPAs, 3.8, 3.7, 3.9. That's where they're going to be because they're Emory students and they're really sharp. <clears throat> but the very rare student will have a 4.0. Now, a 3.7 from Emory University looks better on an application to medical schools than a 4.0 from Southeast Cupcake State. <laughs> Anything from a university of the first rank carries weight with it and the knowledge is there that it's not easy to do well at these places. So a respectable, good 3 point something GPA is going to be A-OK. -okay. And that's what we would hope for all the students. And most of them are up there. That's not because of great inflation, it's because they're smart. So your expectation should be that they're going to do well. They're going to do well, but they're not going to have 4.0s. Now, how do we get them to that graduation where they're not going to have a 4.0, but pretty close? <clears throat> Today, you're going to be part of, or tomorrow, a very important moment. And you know that deep in your stomach and in your heart. Because what you've done today, amidst all the excitement, is you've brought a treasure to us. And you're going to leave this treasure with us. And you're going to go home. And that means that something is happening today that you sort of anticipated, even looked forward to, but also dreaded. And that is a moment when your child goes one way and you go another. And that moment of separation is extremely powerful and important. There's a writer named Eli, Eli Wiesel who calls these moments privileged moments in time. And they're defined as moments that are so invested with power and emotion that whatever you say in those moments is elevated to a level of importance rarely achieved. Not only that, what you say that is elevated sticks with these people for the rest of their lives. So you have more to do today than simply say goodbye. You have to take that moment and use it. What is it you're going to say that will be elevated to this level of importance, that will stick forever? Will it be, always keep your room clean? <laughs> don't wear your hair that way. I don't think so. These privileged moments now call for life messages. You know that, life messages. I have loved being your parent. I am proud of you. This is the kind of life we hope you'll live. This is the moral lesson that I would like you to take with you. This is the kind of person I hope you'll become. These are the levels of message. Now, here's the problem. Most of us can't say those things to our children without crying. If you can say them, you should say them when you take leave of your child. In those final moments, when your child is sort of trying to go, <laughs> and you're holding on, you should say these things. And if you can say, think about what they're going to be. And if you can say them, say them. But if you're like me, and like so many other people, you can't say them. After you leave your child, go to a quiet place. If you go to a hotel or an airport or wherever you're going to go, and take out a piece of paper and a pen and a nice envelope and write the child a letter. The letter will begin. When I left you at Emory today, this is what I wanted to say to you. In other words, connected to the privileged moment. And write down what you want to say. Write it on a piece of paper in your own hand. No email. I have a, I, I, 
a group of people who will follow you and find you if you use email. <laughs> we will trace them back. You must write this in your own hand. Look how rare that is. Write it. Seal it. Send it to them. They will treasure it. They will keep it. Don't lose that moment. It will come today, or according to our schedule, 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> when you see the not-too-subtle hint that says, parents leave campus. In our schedule, <laughs> 1 o'clock tomorrow. Take advantage of that moment. Don't lose it. Don't lose it. Now, after the, you leave, they're going to go off and be in the good care of the perky people in purple. <laughs> I, I love these people. These are the orientation leaders, the OLs that are all over the place, right? Every, you couldn't go anywhere today without finding them, right? They have been here for at least a week or more learning how to do what they're doing, which is be perky and wear purple. But they also know everything they need to know to get your students started here at Emory and to get them started properly. How many of you found that there were some older people, gentlemen, helping with purple shirts? Any of you? You know who they were? The president of the university, right. Was the president was moving your boxes in. The chief counsel was moving boxes in. The dean of campus life was moving boxes in. They're not as perky, I got to admit it. <laughs> <coughs> but, but they were in purple, and they are people. So, so, so this is the excitement, by the way, of when students come to, to the campus. The president is not just out there for public relations. He's been doing this forever. He, he does this every year. Because part of this, this day is welcoming this new group into our community which is just as emotional, as exciting, as sending the group off last May. It's a very exciting time for a campus. So we're going to have the students, and they're going to go through a new system of registration. So just so you know what's going to be coming, they're going to tell you <coughs> that they're going to meet with uh, a PACE uh, advisor. PACE is like an acronym. It stands for something I can't remember because it's so new. It says, Pre-Major Advising Connections at Emory pre-major advising connections at Emory. Terrible acronym. But we have to have a name, PACE. We used to have FAME, which was freshman advising and mentoring at Emory, which is also terrible. But, but the idea is that we're going to gather these students together, and they're not going to be alone. They are part of an orientation group already. They're not going to have to go and find friends. They are already part of a group, and they have somebody who leads them wherever they need to go while they still need leading. As soon as they don't need leading, the orientation leaders will back away. But right now, they do. And so they're going to meet with orientation leaders. Tonight, they're going to meet in their dorms, dorm meetings. They'll have orientation leader meetings tomorrow. And then on Monday morning, <clears throat> they're going to go into the new registration system. Now, the new registration system, I think, is, is, is really amazing. Because what, what's going to happen is that every faculty member at Emory, in Emory College, has three advisees in the freshman class. Three, that's all. Just three. And on Monday morning, each faculty member will meet for one hour or 45 minutes with each of his or her advisees. Spend time, meet the student, get to know what the student wants to do, have some four-year talk. What do you want to do when you finish here? Can you have any idea of what kind of things you might want to major in and focus on? And give some advice. And then the students are going to meet with department peer advisors, and these peer advisors you'll hear about know everything about the registration system. And the registration system is now online, different from when we were in college. You see, I, I remember having to call up on a telephone, or you submit cards, and you wait for three days to see if you get your schedule. They register in real time. So on Tuesday morning, they're going to have the first half of their registration. They'll register for 10 hours of credits. And they'll have a random assignment of time to get onto the computer. Now, if they have a late time in the morning half, they'll have an early time in the afternoon half. So it'll all be balanced out so everybody has equal access. They'll, so two sessions, and they'll finish their registration. So by Tuesday evening, they're going to know what their schedule is. Tuesday morning, they're going to think their schedule is going to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 AM, 10 AM, 11 AM, long lunch, 2 PM. Free days. Off, days off, Tuesday and Thursday, and great weekend. 
That's not what they'll have Tuesday night. But Tuesday morning, they're going to seek that. <laughs> That's a really great schedule. But, but you have, probably have to be a senior to get that schedule. <clears throat> now, they're going to get all their courses eventually. They may have bad times. They may have an 8.30 time for a class in the morning, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Still good teachers. It's not where you have the bad teachers at 8.30. Everybody is going to have good teachers, and everybody's going to have the courses they need. All the required courses, those of you who have students in pre-med or pre-business, pre-law, who need certain kinds of requirements, there are plenty of openings in chemistry and biology and calculus for them to be able to get their requirements. They can do that. For English, everybody has to take an English class uh, during the freshman year. There are enough for half of them each semester. So over the, four, the, the one year, everybody will get one. Same thing for the freshman seminars, which are required. Everybody will get a freshman seminar over the course of the first year. If they don't get it the first semester, they get it the second semester. Okay? They have four years to complete their GERs, general education requirements. They're going to say, I've got to finish my GERs, I've got to do it. They have four years. They can finish their last GER the day before graduation to graduate. So even though they're trying to rush and get those completed, there isn't a rush to do that. Okay? So that's what you're going to be hearing about the next few days. They're going to start class on Thursday, and then we're going to wait for five weeks. You're going to wait for five weeks. Five weeks because you're still worried about whether or not they belong here. Is this the right place for them? Can they do Emory College work? Five weeks are going to pass, and you're going to find that you're going to be hearing about midterm exams, or hourly exams, long exams, big exams, not just quizzes. And they're going to study for them. And they're going to work very, very hard. And you're going to be waiting to hear how they did. And they will call you up or email you or text you or whatever it is that they're doing now. And they'll say that they did all right. They did fine on the exam. Maybe they didn't do as well as they had hoped, but they did fine. And you're going to be relieved because they'll be doing college work. But the first exam is important because it's really the first step in becoming a college student. Right now, you've brought us high school students who are really good high school students. And who we have here on this campus today are high school students at college. But they're not college students yet. They're high school students at college. And they're here because they're really good high school students. What's going to happen over the next year or six months or so is that they're going to become college students. And that's a learning curve. It's a process where they're going to have to learn how to study, how to plan their time, how to use their time, how to mix socialization with academics, how to make decisions on their own that are good decisions. All these things are going to have to be learned. And that's part of the process of becoming college students. They will not become college students just because we say they are college students. It's going to take a little bit of time. So it's something I also want you to expect. If you guys want to come in and sit down, feel free. It's OK. It's OK. People walk out on my talks all the time. Maybe people walk out. <laughs> <clears throat> so so here, here's the thing you, you have to know is that, is that the, the freshmen will learn how to be college students. And um, you'll see it happening, but slowly. I, when I, I said I used to teach introductory psychology in here, sometimes a student would leave a book uh, in, in the, uh, the seats and forget about it. And I, and I would go and get it, and I usually put it up here so that the student would come next time and pick it up. And, and if I pick up the book, I could look at the book, and I could tell you what class year the students were in based upon looking at the book in terms of how they're developing their skills as scholars. If I pick up the book and it belonged to a freshman, the entire book would be yellow, <laughs> all highlighted. Oh, that's important, the. See, a sophomore's book would be slightly different. In a paragraph, you might have the first line and the last line of a paragraph highlighted, maybe a word in the middle of the paragraph. A junior's might have one word or two words in the middle of the paragraph, maybe a little summary of what the paragraph says up in the corner. Next, and a senior, who shouldn't be taking this class in the first place, but is only taking it because he didn't take the GER in time, they could pick up the book. There's nothing in it except next to the paragraph, it would say BS. <laughs> tell. Very simple. And that's really the progress that we want to see. <laughs> we want to see that. See, a student starts here and says, everything's good. Oh, boy, everything you say, professor, is, is good. 
Everything you say, mom and dad, I believe. <clears throat> Over time, we know that doesn't continue. It's going to happen. <laughs> They're going to begin saying, well, you know, you have any evidence for that? Do you have any proof for this? Do you have any research on this? Do you have any citations? Then we start getting into a little bit different kind of thinking. But at the start, we're just expecting that they're going to learn to be college students. Now, what else should you expect about their learning to be college students? <clears throat> when, will see, when will you see the effects of being here at Emory? When will you begin to see the effects of the Emory education? Um, first year, at the end of the freshman year? No. They're going to know a lot. They're going to know a lot. Information. A lot of information. And they'll be able to talk to you about a lot of information. Second year, somewhere near the end of the second year, you begin to see a shift in the way they're thinking about things. They know a lot, but now they're also critically evaluating what they're seeing. And you could probably easily win an argument with them now if it was an intellectual one, but when they're sophomores, you'll be having more trouble. Okay? But, but the expectation that I want you to have is that over the four years, you're going to see a dramatic shift in what they know and how they think. But you will not see it early on. You just have to trust us on that. It will happen. And I've seen it happen thousands of times. Okay, but from freshman to senior, an unbelievable change takes place. But it doesn't take place on a day that you can look and say, yep, there it is. Okay, so you be patient about that. We've got them through the first exam. Let's leave them here for a minute. Let's go to your house. <clears throat> Even before. You're going to leave here. And you're going to go home without one of these children. What Jim Wagner calls, you're going to have a child-sized absence in your family. How many of you are bringing your first child? Oh, boy, a lot. All right. And how many bring your last child, your youngest? And middle? Middle child? The smiling people in the back, OK. <laughs> the middle children, we can start with. You've still got children at home, and you've already been through this, so you know. It's a little bit easier. The sociologists, my colleagues in sociology, say that families are actually uh, processes. Everything's a process. But they say that a family is an entity that has a lifespan. And it sort of begins when, in, in a more, most common form, two people marry one another, and they are a couple. And then if you're looking over time, they move over time, and then at some point, a child enters the family. And it's a family with children. And then it moves, and another child might enter the family, and perhaps another child enters the family. And they move as a family with children until today, when suddenly, boom, one of the children, and the sociologists use the term launch, one of the children is launched. <laughs> I'm not sure I like the term, but there it is. One of the children is launched, and the family suddenly becomes one smaller. Now, this is sobering because look how many years we've been a family with children that's been stable, same number of children, and suddenly we have one less. Now, we still have some at home. So we're a family that has one less child, but we're still a family with children. Now, just to play it out over time, the second child or the last child leaves, and then we come down to just a couple. And then over time, there's just one, and then there's none. Pretty depressing. <laughs> but let's go back to here, which is where we are. <laughs> We're back here, where the first child is launched. The first child, the test child, this poor child. First one in kindergarten, first one in elementary school, first one to take driver's test, first one in high school, first one to apply to college, all the while with the parents and all the other children behind looking, watching. <laughs> go ahead, go, go. See if you can do it. <laughs> and so this first child, this is a terrible thing. Just it, 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 You go and see if we're a successful family. <laughs> see if we're doing OK. And so the child goes and is here and is doing fine. We already know that. What's going on with you at home? You leave here. How many of you have three children? Well, see, I had three children too. Here's the great thing that happened to us. We drove home and we went to, which we left our children here. They lived at college. So they were away at school. We went to a restaurant. And we went in and we said, table for four? 
And, I, and, and they said, well, certainly, come right here. And I remember the time of table for five. Table for five? Yes, please, you have to wait over here with those people who can't control their impulses. <laughs> See, and then all the table for four people, right, are just walking by. Because the restaurants have lots of tables for four. So, so you're going to change that experience. If you're bringing a boy who eats a lot, food bill will go down. Are the children at home? There probably looks like there are some other little children here who are being, leaving their older brothers and sisters. They're not unhappy. <laughs> Many of them are happy. <laughs> that that, that, they're, that, that the family structure is going to change, especially with our Emory freshmen not having cars here. It means there's a car somewhere. There's a car in a driveway not being used. So the family changes. It shifts. Now, mom and dad, you, you have to keep dealing with the family. You're driving carpool. You're going to dental appointments. You're going to school meetings and all things like that. So being a family with children doesn't change. But there's a little bit of an emptiness. And there's a little bit of a sadness. And yeah, there is. I have no prescription for that. It's there. And it means that you're moving in your life to a place that's a little bit different, and this is the first warning shot. But you still have the kids to deal with, and so you, you're gonna cope with that, okay? The empty nesters, no way around it. This is a really tough thing. This is a really tough thing. Because in fact, when you leave today, you go to a family where the, the, the child, the, the ch children at home part is is over. And you're going to go home to just the two of you. Now, research shows that this is not a bad thing. That very often couples find after the last child leaves that they're happy. <laughs> they're just not allowed to tell the children that. Okay? But among yourselves, you can say that. But it's hard. It's hard. And here's why it's hard because you spend so much energy and time focusing on the kids. And in many cases, you've sort of sacrificed the relationship. And you don't have things that you, you know, talk about the kids all the time. Now, what the kids are gone, what are we going to talk about? What are we going to do? Now, how much time is it going to take for the first child, when, the families with the first child to adjust? Not a very long time. But how about those of us who leave the last child? I think you have to think in terms of years, years, to adjust to leaving the last child. You might find that you move to a different house, maybe a smaller house. You might change some of your lifestyle. You might go on more vacations, because you can do that. There's some positive things here. But you're going to have to invest energy and emotion and involvement in other things. Community, church, synagogue, civil service, charities, whatever. You need to find places to put your energies. And you need, now listen carefully, you need to say to your child, the last child, you are not responsible for our happiness. You need to release the child from that responsibility. Because I can tell you that they feel it. They feel that when they're leaving you and you're going off and you're crying and you're upset, that they're, they know it, that they're responsible. They're going off to college is putting you in this position. You need to say to them, it's OK. You take care of yourself. And we, you know, it's not like we're getting rid of you. But you don't have to come home to be sure that we're happy. You don't have to make a phone call three times a day to be sure that I'm all right. I'm all right. Even if you're not, lie. <laughs> the kids need to be here and free to develop their lives. And we then, left home, need to be depressed. And if that's, if that's what's going to be depressed and, and go spend some money, a lot of research shows that the best way to cope is to spend money. <clears throat> so go and do these kinds of things. But, but be sure you release the child. Be sure you release the child from that responsibility. So you're going to be, you're going to be adjusting. Uh, they're going to be here learning new things. And then there's going to come this thing called Parents Weekend. October 18th, I think it is, or whatever, close to that. You're going to call up and you say, would you like us to come down for, for Parents Weekend? And they're going to say, no. <laughs> now, so I, I would suggest you, you don't even ask. 
because this is what I know, <clears throat> that, that you should come if you can and want to. And if you do come, they will like you coming. They simply cannot tell you that they want you to come. It's a rule. <laughs> it's not cool. They have to say no. But then when you come, you, you know, you're going to bring money. <laughs> you're going to bring shopping, restaurants, all the things, but not only for them, for their friends. <laughs> it's going to be great. So, you're going to, so come for family weekend. Come if you want to. If you don't want to, if you can't, it's not a horrible thing. But if you do want to come, simply come. Come. It's a nice thing. And family weekend is not parents weekend, by the way. It's called family weekend because we want siblings to come and grandparents or other relatives, family. Believe it or not, the kids miss them. So they're going to be here, and they're going to be working on stuff. They'll come see you at family weekend. They'll have fall break, which probably is nothing. It's a couple of days, and it may not go anywhere in October, especially since family weekend I think is the weekend after fall break. And then comes Thanksgiving. They'll come home at Thanksgiving. Now, here's what's going to happen at Thanksgiving. You will have left their room just the way it is because I'm suggesting you do that. If you want a sewing room, you have to wait. <laughs> Leave their room the way it is. That's their home base. That's the only place that's purely theirs. And when they come in, they will look. If they don't have their own room, if they have their own bed, the space, that should be just, you can knead it up, but leave it the way it, it sort of is. They're going to come home at Thanksgiving, and they're going to come in and say hello, and you're going to be going, and they're going to be out the door. They're going to go see their friends. They want to see their friends from high school. They're going to quickly run to see their friends, and they're going to come back a little bit disappointed. And here's why because Emory will have become their home. They'll even refer to it as home, which would make you mad, crazy. Just, they're going to say, I'm going home. You say, no, this is home. Oh, yeah, I know that they're going to say. I meant the dorm. But they're going to be attached here, and their friends are going to be here, and their activities are here, and the events that they want to talk about are all here. The students that they, they were in high school with are at other colleges having equally good experiences. And they want to talk about their experience. So that they are realizing now that they are not the same that they were even just a few months before, that they're beginning to become, are you ready? Here's the word, hemorrhoids. <laughs> hemorrhoids. Now this term, this term arose in the wheel, which is the campus newspaper, probably about 15 years ago. There was a cartoonist who was like a Gary Trudeau kind of <laughs> Doonesbury cartoonist, and his cartoon strip was called Emeroids, and it was about students at Emory. But the name is just so good, I, you know. <laughs> so, this, so they're becoming Emeroids. <clears throat> and they realize that this is sort of the place that they belong. They're going to come back again, and then we have this major event, which is final exams. Final exams about three weeks after Thanksgiving, not even. That's when we're really going to, the, the, the proof of the pudding. Can they finish college courses, get credits in college? How will they do? And they're going to study for these exams, and they'll be much more efficient than they are on the first exam, and they're going to do fine. I, I assure you, they're going to do fine on the final exams. They'll, they'll get good grades. They'll, they may be the worst semester that they ever have. Not to mean worse when I say they'll get a 3.8 and they want a 4.0. That's the worst. But th it's, this is an adjustment semester, and so that they might find that this is a tougher one. So they're going to finish that, and then they're going to close up th their books, and they're going to go on winter break. Winter break begins mid-December, ends mid-January. Long time. <clears throat> they are ready, people think. Yeah. They're going to leave the dorms. The dorms are going to be locked. The lock's going to be changed. The students can't come back into the dorms until the semester begins again. The reason for this is not to be punitive and keep the students out, it's to keep everybody else out. These are empty dorms with millions of dollars worth of recording equipment, stereos, computers. Nobody gets in those dorms over the winter break. They're, the locks are all changed. They're highly secure. But that means the students can't come back. It means they're going to stay with you. Christmas, Hanukkah, all the wonderful holiday time, cookies, warm milk, all the things. January 2nd, January 3rd, they're going to get an email from a friend from college. 
inviting them to come and visit. Now, in, a sleepover in high school is across town. A sleepover in college is India. <laughs> we, we, have, we have students coming here today from 45 states of the Union, 22 foreign countries. This, uh, people come from foreign countries are not people who live in America who happen to be from foreign countries. They live in these countries. In other words, they go home to those places on the holidays. And one of them will invite one of your children. Come to Calcutta. <laughs> now, December 16th, you'll say, I don't know. December 25th, you say, I don't know. January 3rd, you'll say, call the travel agent. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important that you visit India. <laughs> you know, go. You see, because their life will have changed being here. They're going to call you on the phone. They're not going to send you emails. Begin watching the timestamps on the emails. Because the, cha the, li the life of an Emory student, a college student nowadays, is very different from what it used to be. This campus is awake 24 hours. Our main library, the Woodruff Library, named for Mr. Woodruff, of course, closes from Sunday evening, I think, at 10 o'clock until Monday morning at 7. And then the rest of the week is open, 24-7. 24-7. It's always open. They can have food delivered any time, night, or day. Papa John's, 3 in the morning means nothing. Watch your timestamps. I get timestamps. I get notes. Dr. Duke, are you there? And it says 3.12 a.m. <laughs> This, no joke. No. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not there. But, but the student, so what's going to happen is they're going to come home and they're going to be, you're, you're, you know, 11 o'clock at night, you're in your slippers, you're in your jammies, you're checking the gas, whatever people do nowadays, and they're saying, I'm going out now, bye. And, and they're starting their evening. Emory students work very hard until midnight, and then they go and do things. There are programs scheduled for the middle of the night. Now, in the dormitories, there are quiet hours. If kids want to sleep, they, they go to sleep. I mean, it's not like there's wild stuff. In the dormitories, it's quiet. And there are study hours, and there are times when they, they have to be respectful of everybody else. But there are places you can go and just be free and have a good time. So, when they're home, they're different. They're criticizing you. They're talking about the kind of food you eat. It's not green. It's not natural. It's not organic. <clears throat> you realize that, that they're beginning to grow in a direction, not a bad direction, but a different direction, as, as you are. And so some of this is bittersweet, but nonetheless, that's what's going to happen. You're sending them here because at the end of four years, you want them to be able to sort of be able to function on their own and succeed in their lives. Which brings me to another thing that is really important for me to talk about. And this is, this is for real serious. When the students come here, they're going to inevitably face some problems, roommate problems. They can't do calculus. Chemistry exam, they did terribly. They don't feel that uh, this is the right place for them. Uh, they're not sure of their major. Uh, problems like this. Now, what I want to say to you is this. In the normal course of events, there's no problem that can arise for a student at Emory that the student can't solve on his or her own using the resources that are available here. Okay. Now, it sounds what I just said like a mantra because I've said it over and over, and I'll say it again. In the normal course of events, there is no problem that can arise for a student at Emory that the student can't solve on his or her own using the available resources. Okay? Now, we come to a choice point. <clears throat> you as parents are going to know about the problems. And here's your choice. You can solve the problem. I guarantee you can solve the problem. You're the parent of the child. You've sent the child to Emory. You're paying tuition. We know that. And maybe in the past you've been involved in making decisions and, and, and helping children solve problems. If you want to solve the problem, you can solve the problem. There you go. 
If the student solves the problem using the available resources, the problem will be solved. OK? So that means either if you're involved, the problem is solved. And if they do it, the problem is solved. What's the difference? If you solve the problem, you weaken your child. You prevent your child from growing in strength and being able to deal with his or her own problems. You are not doing anything that is beneficial. Every time you solve a problem, you say to the child, you can't. So don't do it. There are no problems here in the normal course of events that they can't solve. Let them do it. Say to them, this old psychology professor said, you could, you could do it. You could solve the problem. I know he's old, he's bald. Shouldn't even listen to him. But he said, you could do it. Why don't you do it? Tell me when you've solved it. Tell me how you've solved it. And then just sit tight. There are resources on the campus that will help them to solve the problem. They will get it solved. I assure you. It might take longer. But in terms of the payoff for them, it's the way to go. OK? Let them do it. Now, I've said that, and I've said to you, let them do it. But every one of us as a parent knows that there is a voice that our child has that scares us. I want you to just think for a minute about what that voice is. You know, it's this voice that your child has that if the child is really in trouble. It's a slightly different voice. It kind of scares you to hear it. The child is in trouble, real trouble. If you hear that voice, I want you to call right away. Okay? Now, you shouldn't hear that voice very often. I don't think that people hear that voice very often. That's a real trouble voice as compared to, oh, this is hard, this is troubling. That's different. Those voices, I want you to just let them solve it. But if you really are concerned, frightened, worried about this child, then you call the campus. You call the Division of Campus Life. You call the director of the counseling center. You call the dean's office, and you say, my child is scaring me. I'm worried. There's something going on. And I'm and I'm calling you because the old psychology professor told me to. <laughs> now this is what's going to happen. And this is going to reassure you. You know the essays that you met on the dorm floor? The sophomore advisors? Essays? Living on the floor with your students, right? There's an RA on the floor with your students, too. There's a resident director, an RD, in each of the dormitories living in the, in the building. You've heard from the counseling center. You've heard from the health service, or you know about them. These people comprise something that's very special at Emory and maybe unique to Emory, and that's called the invisible safety net. Right now, these people who are living on the floor with your children are part of the invisible safety net. And they've been here for several weeks learning about warning signs in children, in students, college students. What do you look for? When is there something that needs to be brought up as a concern? They have access to the psychological center and to the health service 24-7 on a liaison. They have a phone number, every one of them. They can call. If something's going on with a student, they can call and within 10 minutes be talking to a professional about a student. If they have a concern about a student. If you have a concern about a student, your child, and you call here, almost before you hang up that phone, this essay in your student's dorm will know that you've called and will be talking to your child or checking in on the child. Now, they're not going to come barreling in guns loaded. But if you call and say you have a concern, the invisible safety net is going to be put into action immediately. And the essays and the RAs will be alerted to your concern about what's going on. And they're going to look in and see what's happening. It's invisible, it's not in the way, but it's there. And it works in both directions. If a student is not going to class, if a student seems to be lethargic, not being involved in social activities, they're going to try and do something about that. Imperceptibly, without being intrusive, but nonetheless focusing on the needs of the student. As a parent, this has always made me and always did make me very, very reassured about the, the students being here. And I hope that it does the same for you. There's no in local parentis. In other words, we're not checking their beds and all this kind of stuff. But we are watching them. And if you need a reading on how they're doing, you can get it. 
you can get it. But if they have common everyday problems, let them be. Just let them be. So that's the harangue. That's where I want to you know, let, them, let them deal with the problems. It's not, they're, they're, not, they're not terrible things that can happen to them. A roommate problem can be worked out pretty easily with a, an agreement not to mess up a room and things like that. All kinds of things can happen. Now, I know you're going to go over and listen to the president. We don't want to miss the president. He's a wonderful speaker. He's probably going to put a jack and tie on to meet with you over in Glen. We had this meeting here because it's easier to get to Glen from this spot. But what I want to say to you is that, is that we know that when, when a student comes to Emory, a family comes to Emory, we know that behind every student, every grade that I give, there's a parent and a family who knows what it is and is worried about it. We know that this is a place that is not inexpensive to send your children, that you're deciding to, to put your faith in us. And, and, and I can speak for myself, but I can speak for the majority of the faculty saying we take this very, very seriously. We take it very seriously. So this, the, the, the education that we will give to your, your kids will be the best education they can get. Emory is uniquely positioned as a huge research institution which has a college in the heart of it. A small college with less than 6,000 students in it embedded in this huge research institution. So they can have the close contact with faculty and small classes, and at the same time have access to the Centers for Disease Control, to the Carter Center, to all kinds of incredible laboratory and library resources. And it's a rather remarkable confluence of, of events that allows us to, to have this. It's all because we didn't quibble about the seven semesters. <laughs> Drink Coke. Have a great trip home. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.